Welcome to Flat, Cool, and Acid Free, an OK State Archives podcast, bringing you stories about Oklahoma State University and Oklahoma. I'm Nina Thornton, multimedia producer for the OSU Libraries. On this episode... Uh, so Angie, uh, very, very early on, she made the decision to become a writer. Uh, she, her first book, uh, The Choctaw Republic, uh, won the John Kurt H. Kurt Anderson, Award from researcher Research. for the Oklahoma State University Archives, shares stories about Angie DeBeau. We are going to talk about Angie DeBeau today. So tell me a little bit about your work with Angie's collection and tell me a little bit about the collection. The collection is, is large. Uh, it contains 59 records cartons, three document boxes, 13 oversized boxes, 10 map folders, uh, 85 reels of microfilm, 593 of her treasured books, and uh, furniture from her home in Marshall. Her awards, her typewriters, her dictionary, a very extensive collection. Why do we have her collection? Who is Angie? Angie DeBeau uh, was a uh, very, very gifted uh, historian. She began her career actually in international relations at the University of Chicago when she was getting her master's degree. But uh, when she got back to Oklahoma and found herself teaching in Texas, uh, she became interested in Indian history because she wanted to get a PhD. And her mentor at the University of Oklahoma, uh, Dr. Edward Everett Dale, uh, convinced her to uh, research the Choctaw tribal papers which no one had done uh, previously. And from that moment on, she wrote uh, her dissertation about the Choctaws, and her, it was published and won an award, which was highly unusual for a first-time first uh, publication. And from that point on, uh, her main interest was, was Indian history, uh, but she also branched out into Western history and Oklahoma history, and she even wrote one book of fiction, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Tell me about her backstory. How did she get to Oklahoma? Did she grow up in Oklahoma? Angie DeBeau was born in Beatty, Kansas in 1890. Uh, and in 1899, uh, her family, her, her father and mother, and uh, Angie and her, her younger brother uh, moved to Marshall, which was at the time Oklahoma Territory. Uh, in 1902, she received her common school diploma. And in 1906, she attended one year of high school at the age of 16. And she did obtain a teacher certificate, and she taught in rural schools near Marshall. Finally, in 1913, uh, at the age of 23, she graduated from Marshall High School, which finally had a four-year school. Um, and then again, she taught in rural schools. From 1915 to 1918, she moved to Norman, Oklahoma, where she attended the University of Oklahoma and got a bachelor's degree in history. And it was at that time that she met her mentor and, and lifelong friend uh, from that time on, Dr. Edward Everett Dale. She received her bachelor's degree in 1918. Uh, and then she moved to Enid, Oklahoma. And she was a principal of a village school. And she also taught history uh, at the senior high school in Enid. And then in 1923, uh, she moved to uh, Chicago. She went to the University of Chicago. Uh, it was. Uh, a choice between Chicago or Columbia, and she chose uh, Chicago. Um, and she received a master's degree in history in international relations from the University of Chicago. And then after that, she moved to Texas, where she taught. Uh, she was a member of the history department at West Texas State Teachers College in Canyon, Texas. And at the same time, uh, during those years, she studied for her doctorate, again at the University of Oklahoma, and again under her mentor, uh, Dr. Dale. Uh, but from that point on, she was basically an Oklahoma resident. What is her connection to OSU? So how did we come about, you know, having her collection? And what are her ties to Oklahoma State University? Angie DeBeau was an extremely talented uh, historian. She was a masterful researcher, and her books were well-received. And in this day and age, a woman of her achievements would, would without a doubt, earn uh, a position at a four-year uh, institution uh, on, a fa on a history faculty department uh, roster. But in her day, uh, back in the 1930s, when she published her first uh, book, uh, the Re uh, Choctaw Republic, she was unable uh, to get a position. And it was very difficult for women to uh, get a position in faculty uh, 
as a faculty member of a history department anywhere in the country. Uh, so Angie, very, very early on, she made the decision to become a writer. Uh, she, her first book, uh, The Choctaw Republic, uh, won the John H. Dunning Award from the American History Association. And uh, a man with those kind of credentials would have had a, a, a position easily, but Angie was unable to acquire one, even with uh, Dr. Dale's help and support. And so, as I mentioned, she made the decision to uh, become a writer. And she embarked on that career and published book after book. All of them were successful. All of them were well received. Angie uh, met some people at Oklahoma State University. Uh, one of the most uh, fortunate encounters was when she met uh, Dr. Edmund Lowe, uh, the dean of the library at, at uh, Oklahoma State. And he offered her, uh, because of her reputation as a writer, he offered her a position as the director or the curator of maps at the Oklahoma State University Library. And uh, she was very, very grateful. He did that intentionally. Uh, it did not take a lot of her time. It gave her the opportunity to continue her research and to continue writing rather than be overloaded with teaching students, although she did occasionally uh, work as an adjunct instructor. And she held that position uh, from 1947 through 1955. And she had the wonderful experience of seeing the new library uh, raised. And then she also taught Oklahoma history at OSU from 1957 to 1958. Uh, but it was out of gratitude. She thought uh, President Henry H. Bennett uh, was just a wonderful man. She, she described him as having a Churchillian in intellect. And she, she just uh, idolized uh, Dr. Lowe. And out, I think it was out of gratitude uh, to OSU and those, those men in particular uh, that she made the decision to donate her collection to OSU, which we're very, very fortunate to have. How are you working with Angie's collection? Ironically enough, even though I got my degree in history here at, at OSU, and my specialty is, is Angie's specialty, Indian history, I didn't know a lot about her uh, when I came to work at the library here. And so where I started with the collection, uh, and I've called it Angie DeBeau in her own words, it's my own working title, but I transcribed and, and researched her, her diaries, uh, her correspondence, uh, her oral interviews, and I kind of combined that into a chronological narrative of her life, uh, which made it possible for me to be a contributor uh, to a booklet uh, titled uh, An uh, Dr. Angie DeBow, Oklahoma's Greatest Historian, which I co-authored with Dr. Uh, Karen Neuor here in the library. Uh, we also used my research to uh, I'll put up a display. It stretches the whole length of a wall in, in, uh, on the second floor here at the library. It includes uh, her biography uh, w with photographs and, and, and text, and then a whole uh, several cabinets with her awards, her considerable awards and achievements, and then a third wall uh, that talks about her last book, uh, which was extremely well received, perhaps the definitive biography of Geronimo, which is the title of, of that book. So talk to me a little bit about the DeBeau room. So we have a room special for her that features a lot of her items. Talk to me about what we affectionately call the Angie DeBeau room. I think it would be a room that she would have appreciated uh, greatly. It's very, very warm. Uh, it has, it's carpeted. Uh, it, it has a fireplace and a mantle. Uh, it contains uh, dark wood furniture and, and quite a few pieces from her home in Marshall. Uh, it has wonderful bookshelves with a varied selection of her nearly 600 book collection, uh, which contain, uh, her collection contains Indian and Western histories. Uh, she was fascinated by World War II, of course, living through it. Um, it contains biographies, varied biographies. I saw one the other day of Thomas Paine and, and Lenin, V.I. Lenin, uh, a lot of Russian history. She, she went to Russia, uh, finally, in, in her later years when she was able to afford it. So she has a lot of Russian histories. And then she has some fiction, but they're not pulp fiction. It's not pulp fiction. For example, uh, one of the books is Dr. Zhivago, and the other is uh, Gone with the Wind, and there are others uh, similar quality. Uh, it also contains a 20-volume series of the North American Indian, uh, which was published in 1907 by Edward S. Curtis, uh, which all Indian historians uh, recognize. Uh, 
contains a bookcase from her home in Marshall containing all of her books, um, and her last typewriter uh, named Ananias. She always named her typewriters. So you said that she always named her typewriters. How many typewriters did she have? And do you know the names of the other typewriters? That's fascinating. I do. Uh, she named her typewriters. Her first one uh, was named Pegasus after the winged horse. Uh, the second one was named Blitzen. And then the third one was named after a Greek, uh, an ancient Greek figure, Ananias. So why did she name them? It's just her personality. She just had a really fun, uh, very, very uh, dry sense of humor. Uh, she didn't take herself too seriously, and it was just one of her one of her quirks. She was, in some ways, she was a somewhat eccentric individual, but she just was always doing fun things like that. So there's one important piece in the Debo room that I kind of want to talk about is her portrait. Well, she was the first woman uh, honored uh, with her portrait being hung uh, in the rotunda uh, in the Capitol down in Oklahoma City. And she, again, as an example of her wry sense of humor, uh, rather than taking it too seriously, she always called it her public hanging. Uh, just another example of her tremendous sense of humor. But we have, we don't have that, uh, that particular portrait. We do have portraits of her that were drawn. And the original is hanging in the Rotunda building down in Oklahoma City. But we have a photograph taken by a close friend of hers of the artist who, who painted her her portrait and then we also have the pink uh, fabric chair and footstool that she sat in while her portrait was being drawn. So you talked about her diaries and her journals. Was she a little bit more candid in her journals or talk to me about those? She was very candid in her diaries. Um, I, I personally consider her diaries to be one of the uh, highlights of the, of the Angie DeBeau collection. Uh, they're quite extensive actually. Uh, her first diary, she started as an eight-year-old girl in 1898, and it's fun to read that. You can see already uh, that she would that, that she had a talent as a writer, even as an eight-year-old girl, it comes out. And then she started another one in 1901 at the age of 11, and then she never, she dropped, she stopped uh, writing in her diaries until 1940. And then she writes here on March 4th, 1940, she says, I have been reading the diary of an eight-year-old. It deals with trivial things, but because those things loomed large in the experience of a child, it has a certain elemental integrity. And she says, when I read it again after all these years, I do so wish she had kept it up. I wonder if it would be possible for me to keep faith with that little girl of long ago and write a sequel. And she did. She started to write a diary again in uh, 1940. She continued that through 1942, and then she took another hiatus for six years. But then beginning in 1948, she wrote faithfully uh, for the next 40 years in five-year diaries. And we have a few of those standout entries from her diaries. Let's take a listen. April 1st, 1901. Edwin and I hunted for shells, and I made him think I saw a rabbit. Tonight, Mama told us to get wood, and the first time I brought a stone, and Edwin an old wash basin, and the last time we took the wood to the door, and then told Mama to open it, and then ran off with the wood. I told Edwin to put the cat on the clothesline post, and I went in and told Mama, and she thought the cat wasn't up there, so she said, April Fool. Mama put some strings in the eggs, and she got one, and the rest swallowed theirs. Mama put a handkerchief on Edwin, and Edwin tied Papa's legs together and fastened a newspaper on his leg. Mama pinned Edwin's socks on the carpet and then called him, and he had his shoes off and his socks on, and he jumped up and off came his sock. Mama pinned my hood together. I gave Edwin a piece of bark for sassafras. While I was riding, Edwin had been trying to lariat me. I have two traps set now. Mama made Edwin a cute little dog. Weather, cold and rainy. March 5th, 1940. Yesterday I decided to copy the little diary and today I finished it. Nobody but me would ever care to read it, but I have worked so much with historical documents that I have a mania for preserving every word written on yellowed paper. Following the pattern set by the little Angie DeBeau of long ago, I hastened to record that it was a lovely spring day, that the town's children were swarming, and that we were visited by Sadie Goodnight, Mrs. Adams, Mrs. Payne, 
and a most persistent soap salesman. I myself called on Mrs. Griffin and Mrs. Rogers, and I am ready to commit myself to the effect that Mrs. Rogers is the sort of person I should like for a friend. Perhaps I may in time mark this page with red letters. May 7, 1953. We are all looking forward to dedication of library tomorrow. Have made plans to have it look just right for visitors from all over U.S. will be there. May 8, 1953. This is our big day. Library filled with distinguished librarians all morning. Dedication in PM and more visitors. Carillon concert. Very lovely. In evening we had ballroom packed. Capacity 500 and overflow. Wonderful weather. The library looked lovely. Flowers and spit and polish. July 20, 1969. Watched the moon landing this p.m. Tense experience. Very moving when it succeeded. Time, 3.17 p.m. Then watched the moonwalk. Enormously moved. Stayed up till 1 a.m. to see if the men were in contact and okay. What other books did she write that we could look up or read or? One of my favorite authors is Larry McMurtry, who wrote Lonesome Dove. And here's another story for you. Larry McMurtry credits Angie DeBow with inspiring him to become a writer. When he was a boy of 11, he went to a, his father was a West Texas rancher, cattle rancher, and they went to a cattle auction and in the parking lot, uh, Larry McMurtry tripped over a copy of uh, Angie DeBose Creek History, Road to Disappearance. And he, 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 couldn't, he didn't understand it at his age, but he would read some passages, short passages, and he just loved the book and he treasured it. And he credited, credits her to this day with inspiring him to become a writer. He calls her three books, The Choctaw Republic, The Road to Disappearance, and, and Still the Waters Run. He calls those three books her Indian Trilogy. And I believe that, you know, she, from what I can tell from her correspondence and from her diary entries and from her oral interviews, she considers those three books to be her most important, uh, that Indian trilogy. But she also, she wrote a history of Tulsa. Uh, she wrote a single work of fiction called Prairie City, uh, the story of an American community, which, although it's fiction, it's based on uh, actual experiences and actual historical events. Uh, in fact, Alfred A. Knopf uh, the publishing company actually gave her a fellowship uh, because it was uh, considered history, even though it's a work of fiction. Uh, she edited the reminiscences of an old cowboy and uh, uh, teamster, uh, Oliver Nelson. And then at the age of, it, it's a remarkable achievement, at the age of 86 years old, she published uh, Geronimo. Uh, which many, many scholars consider the definitive biography of, of Geronimo. Um, again, kind of the final installment of her Indian histories. So you recently, with Dr. Karen Newar, um, went to Marshall and she did some tours? Yes. I mentioned the only work of fiction Angie DeBoe ever wrote, um, Prairie City. And her hometown she became so well known and so famous that her hometown of Marshall actually created what were called Prairie City Days. There would be a big parade, uh, the high school band would march down the street, all of the inhabitants of Marshall and the surrounding region would come. Angie DeVoe would dress herself up uh, as a 19th century pioneer woman and would either be driven through the parade in a Model T Ford or in a, in a wagon on the, on the seat covered wagon and it was to honor her and that town did that for for many years and part of that celebration was a tour that Angie DeVoe gave um, they would go around in a school bus she would she would take folks on us in a school bus and go around um, the Marshall area showing where the town the first town was they actually moved it after its after its first settlement uh, to its present location and then other fascinating uh, places, there were uh, out, the uh, outlaws uh, were, were killed and apprehended. Uh, she tells the story about that, the first, uh, the first gusher. Uh, she, she would take folks to the first oil well in the, in the county. 
and, and other, other interesting homesteads uh, where her family had their first dugout. Um, and so what we're doing, uh, Dr. Neuauer, myself, and, and um, Kevin Dyke down in MAPS, what we're doing, uh, we've been to Marshall several times, we've, we've reproduced the route, and we're, Angie DeBeau wrote on the back of recipe cards and on uh, typewritten paper, uh, she would write these, these cards that she would read to folks, and then because she couldn't do all the tours, she, she wrote these cards so that other folks could also uh, lead the tours, and they're filled with just fascinating anecdotes and descriptions of the places that she would show people. And, and we transcribe those cards in order, and uh, we're, we're going to create a, a, a living map, a, a virtual tour uh, that folks can access by computer and, and actually go on the tour and see the, see the, the sites that she, that she showed, uh, the folks that she took on these tours. In many cases, the buildings that were there when she was uh, conducting the tours are now gone. Uh, so we're filling in with, with uh, period photographs and, and textual descriptions. Kurt, thank you so much for chatting with us today. Oh, you're very welcome. It's been my pleasure. Special thanks to Kurt Anderson and Karen Neuer for providing us with a sneak peek into their research of Angie DeBose life and to Taryn Mormon for giving a voice to Angie DeBose diary entries. The library hosts a suite of podcasts that can be found at library.okstate.edu, on Stitcher, and Apple Podcasts. Digital collections in the OSU archives can be found on the OSU Libraries website at library.okstate.edu and search for digital collections. You can find those links to our podcasts and the archives digital collections in the show notes. This episode of Flat, Cool, and Acid Free was hosted by Nina Thornton. The music is It's a Process composed by Ben Stone and Finley Green, and published by BBC Production Music PRS.